All right. Um, if all the committee members could come back to their desks, wherever they happen to be. Senator Skinner and Assembly Member Kamlag, are you with us? Let's give them one more second. Thank you all for, for coming to join us today. Really appreciate it, especially under these circumstances. Morning, Michael. Um, all right. So uh, thank you, and we're back in session with the Penal Code Committee. Our second panel moves from the streets and prison and jails to prosecutors um, and representatives from the police, uh, from the chief probation officers of California. Um, we also had invited um, a representative from Crime Victims United who may or may not be joining us, but hopefully that she can figure out a way to log in, but we're gonna plow ahead uh, without her. Um, as a reminder to the panelists, we've read your submissions. So in your opening remarks, please keep them to five minutes and the highlights so we can move on to the conversation. And I also wanna reiterate that we're not exploring issues related to um, any in initiatives that may be on the ballot in November. Our mission is really uh, for the next legislative cycle and um, the, the advice that we hope to get from you and, and particularly specific proposals for that legislative session would be the most helpful uh, use of our time, at least. Um, our panelists are District Attorney Steve Wagstaff from San Mateo County, who is a past president and representing the California District Attorneys Association. Deputy District Attorney uh, Paul Nunez from the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. And uh, Chief Ke John Keene, Chief Probation Officer from San Mateo County and Legislative Chair and Secretary of the Chief Probation Officers of California. Thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Um, we're gonna start with uh, DA, DA Wagstaff. Thank you and uh, Michael, good morning. Thank you. We haven't seen each other for a while. I'm glad to see you and thank all of you for giving me the chance. Uh, and to John Keene, our chief probation officer, I'm proud San Mateo County gets to have two of the three panelists here. We do view ourselves as the garden spot of the world. It's the, the, mo it's the model for the rest of the state if not the country. So. <laughs> thank you, Michael, I, I like that. The, no, offense, no offense to the rest of you. <laughs> the other 57. Uh, and I do speak for CDAA, but of course, you know, we're a very, as John will say, we're a very wide and different group. What uh, Paul Nunez will tell you about LA is completely, you know, different than many others. So it's hard for me to say I'm representing the views of all the DAs because we are a very diverse group, more so now than at any point during my career. And, and I love that part of it. I love the diversity of attitudes that we have developed uh, if anybody ever tells you, well, the DAs feel, they don't know the DAs because we really uh, have a whole variety. You know, in the Bay Area, I'm sort of known in the Bay Area as being one of the more traditional DAs, but there are plenty of topics like on the money bail issue, which for many years now, I have had a very strong view uh, um, against money bail. So it really does vary with the uh, topic. But what I can do, I believe, in speaking for our association and at a minimum for me, is to offer up in these few minutes of, uh, four ideas that I want to give to you. Number one, uh, one is, uh, and it echoes Governor Brown, when I watched him, as I've watched your hearings and watched Governor Brown speak several weeks ago, when he talked about the size of the penal code. I want to mention that. I did in my very brief, my two pages, I mentioned that. Number two, I want to talk about clarity for all of us. Number three, I would like to talk about transparency for us. And finally, I want to talk about uh, our feeling and what our belief is, is concerning victims and yours. Because everything I say to you today, I say as if I was sitting in your chairs. If Governor Newsom had decided to say, you know what, we need one of the old guys. So let's get, let's get Wagstaff in here to give a few thoughts. And so uh, I do say this with the idea of what I think can work for you. Um, when I mentioned uh, the penal code, as Governor Brown has told us many times, he told me many times when he was governor, look how long it is. I listed the pages in there. I actually looked it up. It is double today. And I'll show you, you know, you know, I'm not real good in PowerPoint, but I'm pretty good at the old fashioned DA at using uh, props. And this was the penal code, 1977, when I came, became a deputy DA. I, um, I've never held another adult job, I should mention. I joined the DA's office while I was in law school, and then I've never left. So I am a rut man. But look at the size of it there. And let me show you, this is 2020. 
it's double the size. So those are my props, no PowerPoint, but those are the props. I really do agree with Governor Brown. I think that would be a great thing you could do as best you can, because of course the penal code over the years, and I've watched it over my 43 years as a uh, prosecutor, is it's like the Winchester Mystery House. We just keep adding rooms. There's no theme, There's, nobody calls it a particular type, but we just keep throwing rooms on top of things. And it has led to so many of the things that you've talked about during your sessions, which is what do we do to make it manageable? The legislature enacted these laws, governors signed them, and every one of them was for a very specific purpose. Each of you in the legislature, you know, Assemblyman Kamalaga Dove and Senator Skinner, you have put a legislation through to fix a problem. And those are good ideas. They were accepted and they are our law. That's uh, what we do. Don't smile at me. I know exactly why you're smiling because I do have this feeling when I've watched uh, uh, criminal justice reform over from starting what, 2011 with AB 209, which I loved. John Keene can tell you about how he took that in our county and we have numbers and it is working. It is working wonderfully. As to the others, as you know, many of you may know, probably not, I'm a nothing little guy, but I was out there as the president opposing some of those. But what I told my staff, my attorneys, my 60 prosecutors, the day after those uh, initiatives were passed, I said, you know what, that's our law. And our job and our branch and our division of government is that's the law and we're gonna enforce it. We're not gonna do workarounds. We're not gonna try and hide it. It's the law. And that's what I've learned over my 40 years uh, is that you know we follow the law. And that's the same with the legislation that came through. Anything that you do, we make it work. We look, um, you know, Senator Skinner to the felony murder rule. We look to what your intent was and we say, that's the law, make it work. Make it so, um, do what the intent of it is to do because we are not the legislative body I've said to people who complain, if you don't like it, go run for office and be a legislator. We're an enforcement agency. Second thing is clarity. What I have watched over uh, the years is, and I noted it a little bit in my handout, you know, we, we go through phases. Back in the late 70s when I started, things were very broad. Things were, we trusted, uh, in, in, I was actually here when determinate sentencing was signed. And that panel, like yours, worked for three years to come up with that uh, determinant sentencing. I heard loads of groans and things then too. But uh, after it was signed, it was enacted, put in, and it took discretion a bit from Department of Corrections, gave it to judges. In the 80s, the legislation didn't like that so much. So our governor and legislators passed a whole bunch of laws that put in mandatory sentences, which you know there uh, were there. What that was doing is saying, judges, we don't think you're doing it the right way. We're going to give it, what it did is it gave it to DAs because what we did is we don't have to ask for an allegation. It gave it to us. And I have to tell you that I think at many, many times over the years, I saw it a misused, I saw it well used. So um, it's there. now it's changed in recent years to take that away from us by eliminating the mo most of the mandatories are eliminated and it gives discretion to the judge. What we look for is clarity, clarity of where things are and what we can do. So that's what I ask you as you go through and are looking at the laws on a broad sense give it clarity for, you know, the really bright prosecutors. I'm sure, uh, sure like Paul, a really bright prosecutor. And then you get the dummies like me that struggled to get where we are today. Make it simple for us. The third one, transparency. I think it's so important that there be transparency in everything we do. We know that as DAs today, that our whole focus is be transparent in what you do, whether it's officer involved critical incidents uh, that we evaluate and investigate, or whether it's just our actions. I, there is, as I say to my trip, there is nothing we do that I will not stand up in front of the public and say, here's why I did it. You can disagree, but here's why I did it. It was one of the reasons that I didn't care for Prop 57 is because it went all behind the prison walls as to what was going to be done. The incentive credits are fine, but the idea is I want to tell victims, here is when we can expect that the person who uh, you were victimized by will be getting out because that really matters to them. And so I wanted transparency, but simply maybe by cost, effort, whatever, that couldn't be done. And uh, I wish that as you look at it, as you look at every one of your sections, you look at it with that in mind. I do believe that you should consider trusting judges. I do believe in the separation of powers that we have in this state and our government. And that is to trust our judges. And as you look there, I remember when I was hearing my good friend next door neighbor county, Jeff Rosen is the DA speaking to you. And he talked about, hey, if you want to get rid of all the enhancements, because we're worried about that. I mean, okay, mine is give the judges as many tools as you can, if you feel comfortable as a legislative body or what you recommend to the legislature, if you feel comfortable in giving them. I do. 
And I disagree with judges every day of the week. That's part of the system. That's okay. But the key is in the end, as Justice Marino know, because when you set the rules, when you were writing those opinions and set the rules, that becomes my law. And I respect that. As I always said, we respect it in what we do. And so I do hope that uh, we can give that trust to them on that line. And finally, not to take away what I thought was going to be uh, Nina Salarno's uh, comments, and that's victims. Because victims are why I have stayed in this business for all these years. I could have retired many years ago. It wasn't my intent because I care about victims. I care about them feeling. And I do hope and that you keep that on your scale as you evaluate the code. I listed in the two-page handout this, the various statutes that your legislature has enacted and been interpreted by our courts over the years to give victims rights. That is very important to me. It's so important to me. In my office, what we've done, I know that the way the law, Marcy's law was written, it said only when there's something from the uh, victim makes a request. I said, this is way too important. In all felony cases, we do it in all cases. We'll uh, make the effort. And because I just think they are at times the forgotten. When I started my career, they were the forgotten component. I don't want to finish my career with them being the forgotten component. So I would ask you as you evaluate the code to keep them in mind as to what we can do while accomplishing our goal. Remember, I do agree with the uh, thought, we serve our victims by helping our offenders not reoffend, And I very much do agree with that, but sure. I do agree that they are victims and where they are. And so for that sorry, point, I finish with that. I'm sorry to cut you off. Uh, not at all, you, Michael. I know I, once I no, get no, going- No, 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 we'll, we'll give you plenty of time. We just, the, the fun part is the is the is the putting you on the seat for the Q and A. I I'm just want to try to keep us on, on task. Thanks, well. Michael. Thank you, thank you, DA. Uh, Deputy DEA Nunez, uh, we have five minutes. Thank you for uh, having me. Um, and our office um, welcomes the opportunity to be a part of this collaboration. I was on a, um, or I was about to leave for the airport on March 12 um, when the pandemic struck because I was um, asked by the DA to um, monitor or be as much available to this committee as, as I could as a representative for our office. And I don't want to repeat a lot of the uh, sentiments that uh, DA Wagstaff just um, uh, talked about in, in his five minutes. So I will move on um, to what I think the committee has seen in our um, materials that I had presented. Um, and that is the idea that, you know, personally and as, a, as an office, we are always very deeply concerned about the victims, the victims of violent crime as one of the assistant head, uh, head deputies of the gang unit or the gang division in Los Angeles County, hearing you talk about other countries and the comparisons that are being drawn, I realize that I'm probably sitting in a seat that sees more violence and reviews more violence in this world than, than, than most people. Um, and I go back to assembly member Kamlagar Dove's concerns about prosecutors from the last meeting and what she has expressed today. And that is the tremendous amount of power that prosecutors have. And I wanted to assuage some of your concerns about that and let you know a little bit about me and the people that I work with. So as you understand our frame of mind and our perspective, um, I truly am a citizen of this state. I grew up in the Central Valley. Um, my grandfathers were braceros. Um, I got the fortunate, the, the, the ability to, to attend Stanford uh, and attend UCLA. I've been in this office for 25 years. 25 years ago, I was in front of Judge Peter Espinoza in Southgate, um, where I learned the ropes. Uh, I studied under uh, Justice Re uh, Reynoso in, at UCLA. I lived in Senator, I mean, I'm sorry, Assembly Member Kamlanger Dove's uh, district for, for, for over a decade. And like Senator Skinner, I am a vowed uh, non-gun owner. So why did, how did I get into this position and why am I here? It, 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 it goes back to my parents, the fact that they raised four kids. One of them's an inner city school teacher. One of them's a, a union rep. Um, one of them's a doctor. And, and the fourth one is, is a government service uh, attorney. And it all stems back to what this committee is about, and that is the need to protect public safety. And during my career, after being with just uh, Judge Espinoza in Southgate, I went on to be in the, the gang division for a number of years. 
but I also worked for four years in the justice system integrity division where um, I prosecuted police officers. I prosecuted a, um, a cold case that happened 25 years ago, uh, a, a detective that was charged with murder. And uh, I was able to secure, uh, secure the conviction in that case. I was also um, tasked with prosecuting a, a sheriff that committed a murder in the San Fernando Valley. And I was able to secure that conviction as well. I also prosecuted a, an individual, a school police officer that simulated his own officer involved shooting that cost the city of, uh, city of Los Angeles $400,000, where I was able to secure, make sure that person went to state prison and also get a $400,000 restitution for the city of, uh, of Los Angeles. I've also been a district attorney, uh, deputy in charge of East LA, where I was tasked with overseeing the misdemeanor courts in that area. And now I'm here working on cases that are probably the most violent in, in our state. Unfortunately, we are not seeing a, a, a dip or um, we have not come to the lowest point in the murders that are and the, and the violent crimes that are being committed in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, gangs and the, um, are still um, prevalent in our communities. They're still committing a lot of heinous, really um, gruesome, gruesome crimes. The gun allegation is very important to us as well because we are seeing coordinated attacks um, throughout the city of LA. The one thing that I would like to highlight that doesn't really get talked about is how ubiquitous video cameras are. And everyone knows they're around and everyone um, realizes that everything that they do is being caught on camera. The criminals know this as well. We have seen in the last few years, uh, a very dedicated um, concerted effort by groups to go from one neighborhood to another in stolen vehicles and borrowed vehicles with, with masks on, with hoods on and, and using a, a, a lot of subterfuge to commit these crimes. These are first degree murders that are being committed by groups of individuals. And I watched last week's um, or last month's episode of, of this committee, um, fully aware that, that, um, that those two allegations are under, uh, under some pressure by this committee. And I want to um, let you know that I'm available today and throughout the course of your, your proceedings to um, answer any questions about those two very important allegations. Thank, thank, thank you very much. And, and like I said to the last panel, I'm going to say to you guys, we're all, we're you know looking forward to engaging with you. But it, this is just the beginning of the conversation. Um, of course, victims are important to us, especially victims of violent crimes. Some of us on this panel are survivors of crimes and survivors of violent crimes. You know, I don't want to go that to go unsaid. The other thing that should go on, not I don't want to go unsaid, and something that's been eye-opening to me is that the vast, such a large majority of the criminal justice system is nonviolent crimes and misdemeanors, and that the most popular sanction, actually, is probation. Um, and um, that leads me to Chief Keene. Um, and uh, I was hoping that, uh, you know, I have lots of questions for you, but, you know, could you give us uh, five minutes on your perspective and then we'll open it up to the group? Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. It's great to be back in front of this committee again. Um, I will tell you up front that when I saw that Steve and I were gonna be on the same panel together, I took the liberty to prepare some comments because I know pretty quickly he and I can kind of get off the rail and go into very long existential conversations about you know the benefits of this and, and how we see things and how we believe. So I'm gonna read some things I prepared really quickly because I think it'll be uh, informative. So once again, thank you both. Thank you all for allowing me to be here today. I appreciate the opportunity to be back in front of you and to talk about our efforts in community safety with regard to probation and really probation's unique perspective and ethos within the uh, California public safety continuum. Uh, first of all, let's like to take a quick minute to talk about probation. Uh, as Chair Romano said, uh, we are uh, an alternative to incarceration, the most popular alternative car to incarceration. However, our role is oftentimes misunderstood within the public. And so the most overlooked element of that is that in the criminal justice system, probation is an alternative to incarceration. While there is a supervision component to probation to hold people convicted of crimes accountable, our goal really is to move people out of the system 
by helping their rehabilitation through using evidence-based strategies. Probation officers are peace officers. However, they're peace officers who enforce court orders. But we are really focused on successfully helping people leave the system permanently um, through the transformative and proven evidence-based processes that we've learned over the years. It can really be summed up as like this. Uh, we believe that crime prevention and crime avoidance is the best form of public safety. And when we follow research, evidence, and data to guide change, we further move towards that goal. In order to achieve long-term sustainable community safety in our communities, this has to continue to be our primary effort, which is moving people out of the system permanently. Working towards that goal, probation in California is really a connector between the courts, local government, law enforcement, social services, schools, and nonprofits, to name a few. Probation as a profession is a community service model where we bring together many facets to best address the behavior of individuals through linkages to programs and direct services to help create rehabilitative change. These services also oftentimes include workforce development, substance use treatment, mental health services, family engagement, education, just to name a few. In the past decade, as, as DA Wagstaff mentioned, California has undergone significant reform in the justice system and the probation chiefs have helped to lead, implement and defend effective reforms. Reforms like SB 678, AB 109 and Prop 57, we feel strongly help to help California achieve outcomes in a criminal justice system that will enhance safety in our communities. We focus our support on policies that are backed by research and that will help our clients in the cycle of crime and, and goes towards what we really believe in, which is long sustainable community safety. Mm -hmm. Now, while we have a strong track record of, of supporting reforms that are thoughtful and well put together, we feel a responsibility on behalf of our clients and our communities to express concerns when they are necessary. We do so with the goal of moving the system towards and forward in a way that helps support our clients, our victims, and our communities. While, uh, while California has undergone many policy reforms, there are a few areas in the penal code that we would like to encourage this committee to consider. Uh, one would be mental health and substance use issues, and the other would be linkages to substance use treatment programs. Our clients often have significant mental health and substance use issues, which this panel knows very well. We encourage the committee to look at state and community resources to address these factors to help uh, build better continuums of care. Also an important element in a person's rehabilitation is the successful completion of programs that have shown to help address the underlying issues of their behaviors. Changes in recent years to reclassify certain misdemeanors, certain felonies as misdemeanors have subsequently changed our linkages by which people are connected and incentivized to complete programs and participate in drug court models. And I know uh, DA Wagstaff, who is very much a strong supporter of our specialty courts in San Mateo County, has seen the dramatic reduction uh, in our population and those we serve um, as a result of some of these changes. By changing several felonies to misdemeanors, some of the linkages that would have traditionally helped case management to connect incentivized programs and treatment have also unfortunately changed. We would hope that we could look at a way to incentivize coordinated linkage to drug courts and the completion of programs. And lastly, there are a couple of emerging issues that we would also like to highlight for the committee. Uh, the three uh, issues we would like to highlight are transitional age youth, the pretrial programs, and reentry as a model moving forward. Uh, within the transitional age youth discussion, the scientists have discovered young offenders age 18 to 25 are still undergoing significant cognitive brain development which can give us important information on how best to change their thinking and move towards more effective rehabilitation. Probation has adopted a pilot program via SB 1004 from Senator Hill back in 2016 that has helped to establish deferred entry adjustment programs to serve young adults in the juvenile system. Previous to DJJ's realignment this year, we proposed the Elevate Justice Act, which would seek to establish individual treatment programs and rehabilitative programs based on specific risk and protective factors. This would also allow us to serve 18 and 19 year olds in the juvenile justice system, which age appropriate intensive services. We have supported pretrial efforts uh, that will maximize public safety and maximize return to court and mitigate the highest risk by targeting release decisions and interventions through the risk principle. And then lastly, with reentry, it is important that linkages between rehabilitative programs 
uh, offered during incarceration and upon reentry are coordinated to provide a seamless reentry that supports not only community safety, but successful transition to life outside of the criminal justice system. We also know this population often has significant needs relative to housing and employment. I don't need to tell this committee that, but I will say it just the same. And we must continue to support ways to look for ways to support our clients in their reentry. One of the things that we really believe in San Mateo County around reentry is that reentry starts from the very first moment they are put into a custodial setting. We have to start thinking about what will their reentry back to the community look like. So we really believe that there is uh, opportunities out there to enhance that model um, across the state, and we look forward to helping support this panel in those conversations. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start off here, uh, Chief Keen. Can you just unpack in a little bit more? I'm totally unaware of the the young adult program that you described mm -hmm. and say, so what's the problem and what do you, what is your bill trying to fix? Can you, what's, what's going, can you just unpack that a little bit for me? Sure. So the transitional age youth bill back in 2016 was really created to look at and create pilot programs in a few counties to look at if, would it be possible to take this young emerging adult population, this 18, 19, potentially 20 year olds. And when you use the information we now know about cognitive brain therapy, I mean, it's cognitive brain science. And what it tells us that many young adults really don't fully form the ability to reason and make cognitively sound decisions well to the age of 24 to 25. This right, bill- So what is I'm it so what you do? I'm sorry. So the bill, in essence, takes 18 and 19 year olds who would traditionally move into the adult system and keep them in the juvenile system and taking a more restorative juvenile approach to managing them versus them going into the adult court. And you you've proposed to expand that. So it's a pop. So it's been a pilot in a handful of counties. So yes. And the, and yes. And the idea would be to utilize what we know about brain science to expand it. Um, now, of course, now with the DJJ transition and some of the other changes in the law, we want to be careful not to overload the system with too much change, but we do believe that there is a space uh, in that cohort to do some effective treatment programming and prevent younger, uh, young adults from moving further into the system and increasing their chances to leave the system permanently. I think that that's interesting. I'm going to be a broken record here, and we'd, we'd love the data uh, on you know, that program and especially, you know, pilot programs that are successful, right? That's the point of pilot programs. Mm -hmm. let's, let's make them more than pilots. Um, do other folks have questions before I jump in? I do. I just uh, like to we'll know what- with, We'll start with Song, uh, with, with Dean Richardson, because she hasn't spoken yet. Um, thank you. I really appreciate all of you being here and the, the testimony um, that you just shared. So I have a number of different questions. I'll just, um, list them all. So for uh, DA Wagstaff and Deputy DA Nunez, I'm curious about your thoughts on what we can do as a committee to address some of the racial disparities that exist in discretionary decision making. So uh, DA Wagstaff, you talked about this perennial problem of moving from mandatory uh, minimum sentences to determinant sentences and going back and forth. Right? We, we keep doing this because we're trying to figure out a way to address disparity. One of the reasons is to address disparities that exist um, in sentencing, but we also know there are disparities in the way gun enhancements are, um, are implemented by DAs. So what can we do um, as the as we review the penal code to address those disparities somehow because i'm sure both of you have given great thought to that and then i had one question for you chief keen um, you would mention talking about you, you would mention the difference between the ability to incentivize treatment at least this is how i heard it um, with felony by having felonies versus misdemeanors. It is more difficult when you have misdemeanors um, to incentivize the completion of very important programs that, as you indicated, we need uh, to help with reentry, right? Because one of your goals, as you mentioned, is to help people successfully um, enter, reenter the community. I'm wondering if you have thought yeah. that we can think about um, of creating those incentives for misdemeanors. 
Because with felonies, we know, right, and you care very much about this, as you talked about, having a felony may, on your record makes it incredibly difficult to, to do the things we want um, once you are out of custody. So it seems a heavy price to pay, right, to have felonies in order to incentivize what we want, which is treatment. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how we can create those incentives using misdemeanors instead. So those are the questions um, that I have. So if we start with the racial disparity question, I guess, to the, to the prosecutors? Sure. Um, I know that there is um, a concern about the disparate impact of the gang allegation on communities of color. The, 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 the thing that I keep focusing back on is there's a disparate um, effect of violent crime on communities of color. The victims that I have um, been involved with, the victims of murder, have come from Pacoima. They've come from South Central Los Angeles. They've come from uh, you know the hard area, hard areas of Pomona. And um, what we see um, because of the prosecution of the gang allegation is that um, unfortunately uh, these lower economic areas have have are hardest hit by uh, the intrusion of gang violence. May I yeah. interrupt for a second because I I, I get that point. Um, right. The problem with the gang enhancement that's just so glaring, 92 plus percent of people who get the gang enhancement are people of color. Right. I don't believe that 92 percent of homicide defendants or homicide victims are people of color. It's, I mean, when do we get to when it's 100 percent? Is it just fully a race-based enhancement? I mean, like 92 percent is just so hard to look at and see that, that we don't have a racial disparity. Well, and I totally get that communities of color are having a tremendous amount of crime. The gang problem, I'm not saying it's not real. It's just that it seems to be enforced either by the police or DAs or whomever disproportionately again. When, when, I, when I appreciate that concern. Number, it's just, I, it's, I appreciate it's, that concern. And what I would say to that is this, that Again, you have a fair-minded individual that's that's sitting in this chair. We're not coming to work every day thinking that we're going to do something to impinge the rights of individuals. We're looking at the crime, the conduct itself, and thinking about the violence that occurred. And we're thinking about why it occurred. Uh, oftentimes, the individuals that are the victims that are murdered have been defendants or criminal, you know, have been criminally charged with offenses in the past. So we are defending individuals and, and, the, and the justice that they deserve in these actions, regardless of who they are. Um, but uh, the one thing that I would like to point out is that there are a lot of smart individuals on the bench across the courtroom from us, and they're, they're operating with um, the same scrutiny that you're, you're operating on with as well. Um, if I don't have the evidence in front of Judge Espinoza to get past the preliminary hearing on the gang allegation, he's not going to hold it to answer. If the, if the jury doesn't ap appreciate that the motive for the crime was that somebody in the, on the Vermont corridor that lives in the 30s went up to the 60s in a coordinated attack with a driver and two other shooters and maybe a follow car, then they're not going to hold those individuals um, responsible for those crimes. So I am not saying that um, the gang allegation uh, is, is, is trying to resolve all of our problems because as what Justice Becerra said or, or A.G. Becerra said, it's better to prevent than to remediate. So DAs like myself, we go into, we have a program called Project Lead where we go into inner city schools where we try to educate individuals about um, fifth graders about the ills of any sort of crime that could occur that they could be enticed to to commit and we try to show them that there's ways of, of, of avoiding that you know my, my mother who's celebrating her birthday today she's 62 years as a as a kindergarten teacher in this state you know she it's all about prevention it's all about helping kids get educated get good jobs and avoiding the criminal justice system can I just jump in very quickly, Michael? I just want to have a, I have a follow up. Um, 
So I'm not, I just want to make this clear. I'm not saying uh, that any deputy DA, either you, uh, DA Nunez, or anyone in your office is consciously on purpose um, treating people of color differently than they're treating other people. Like that, that is not what I'm I appreciate saying, that. Uh, at all. However, there are disparities that exist when you look at similarly situated people. And when we think about gun enhancements, for instance, or the gang enhancements, or the type of crime that people are, uh, are accused of or indicted for or charged with, right. these disparities exist. They do, right? right? And so I, I'm not saying that anything you just said is incorrect or wrong or anything like that. What I am asking is, given that these disparities exist, what can we do uh, as this penal code committee to try to address them, right? So it's not saying that people are doing anything wrong. We know unconscious biases exist. That's one reason um, similarly situated people are treated differently. Uh, and so none of us want that. Like that's my assumption. Everyone at this hearing today does not want that. And, and we want to reduce crime. We want to treat people fairly. I'm just assuming that as, uh, right. uh, as, a, as a floor. So do you have ideas for what we can do with the penal code to try to address those existing disparities. That's what I'm struggling with and trying to figure out. So the first you. thing, the first thing that has happened most recently is that discretion has been given to to the judges uh, on mandatory sentencing issues such as the gang allegation. I'm I'm sorry, the gun allegation. So my first suggestion is to trust the judges that are on this committee that they're going to have the discretion and they're going to review and they're gonna scrutinize everything that we do. And if they don't believe it's fair, then they're not gonna impose it. And if, and if we're not, and also we're not gonna charge it if we don't think it's fair. So trust us that we are imposing allegations and enhancements that are truly reflecting the crime that was, that was committed. One of the reasons why I submitted the homicide of LA Times uh, webpage in our um, submission was because you can see, and it puts faces to the individuals that are being convicted, that are, that are being uh, victimized. If you scroll through those faces, they're all African-American, they're all Latino, and they're all being victims of gun, of gun crimes. Um, it's, it's a tremendous problem. And, and I understand that the penal code committee is trying to address these huge systemic issues. But I would ask wow. that the, the legislators that are on this committee um, think about putting more, uh, in, investing more in probation, investing more in education, investing more in good jobs for, for inner city. And that would help to reduce these violent crimes as well. One thing that I don't ever forget is the fact that in LA, the, I'm sorry, the Washington Post two years ago reported that there are 400 million guns in the United States we, we, there's no comparison in the world that we can, that we can have that has this many guns in, you know, on the streets. We're not seeing crimes being committed by just one gun. We're seeing gun men going into neighborhoods. And that level of violence is something I want you to appreciate that is still on our streets. And I would ask you guys, please come talk to me whenever you want. Come talk to members of our of our office. We will always be willing to to share our statistics, as Chairman Romano frequently talks about. Um, we have a lot of statistics that would that could possibly help you. Okay. Well, first of all, okay, a couple of points of order. So th thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, Nina Salerno Besselman. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes. Yeah. Can okay, you hear great. me? You've you've jumped in in the middle of questioning, so I want to give. First of all, uh, a chance to the other panelists to answer Dean Richardson's um, questions. Also, uh, Deputy District Attorney Nunez, I'm going to take you up on your the data offer because we and LA is obviously you know the tag the tail that wags the dog or whatever it is in California. However, sorry for the metaphor. Um, so, DA Wagstaff, I believe the question is to you is to um, to reframe uh, a bit is we appreciate, we don't think that there are necessarily a, 
huge number of racist cops and a huge number of racist DAs and a huge number of racist judges and a huge, but at the same time, it's impossible to stare down the, 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 the statewide data and see that 92% of people who are serving gang enhancements are people of color. Over 80% of people who have gun enhancements are people of color. And the system in general is disproportionately, seems to impact people of color. And I was wondering if you had thoughts, or I guess, am, am I phrasing your question correctly, Dean Richardson, about how we might do that? Um, and is it something that is appropriate for judges, for example, to consider, for example, in their authority under 1385 or other proposals that you might have? And then Dean Richardson, I forget what your second question was, but I think it was for the chief. And then yes. uh, Ms. Salarno Besselman, we'll turn to you for a few minutes um, of, of comments and then we'll back up to questions. Is that all it? And Dean, uh, sorry, Senator Skinner. I just need to clarify one thing. And that is that, you know, when we discuss this issue of the disparities and we look, it's legitimate to, I think legitimate to clarify actively racist. Yeah, probably not present, but I do not in any way want to any of us to accept that this notion that um, that either either our our law enforcement officials, our judges, our DAs, or even any of us on this panel are not racist. And the reason I say that is because in what we know now is that we can't help it. We have a completely racist. Uh, all of the lenses, unfortunately, for for our laws, for much of our cultural perceptions are, are in effect, underlie a deeply racist cir circumstance. And so while I don't think we need to start making any individual feel guilty, I think that we, we just have to say that that is the fact and thus various of either our practices or our penal code not only are applied with these despair with the result of these disparities, but inherently without necessarily intentionally are structured that way. And so I, I just want to clarify that so that we don't play games in terms of what we're dealing with and that what we what we need is concrete suggestions for what aspects of those are more blatantly more blatantly ensure the racial disparity versus others and how do we correct that? Apologies. I agree. So again, to you, uh, DA Wagstaff, Dean Richardson, if then you could rephrase your question to Chief Keen, and then we'll go to Ms. Alerta Besselman. Okay, thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, Senator Skinner, I completely understand what you're saying. Uh, and uh, Dean, I think it's very difficult because what you're talking about is that which constitutionally is given to 58 different DAs. What DA Nunes deals with is in his county bears no resemblance to my mid-sized county. And remember, approximately, I'm the 17th biggest county in the state, and our gang problem is very minimal. There's reasons for that, but the whole point of it is it varies throughout the state and where it's there. But every DA has the right to uh, implement the laws the way they choose. They're not entitled to do it uh, just with uh, inappropriate discretion, but it's very hard for me to think how you, this committee could say, California legislature and governor, here's the way you can change the laws without eliminating those allegations. And that concerns me because what I want to do is be able to give our, in our county, our judges use their discretion to at sentencing, not impose those because it's not mandatory. And they do it quite often where they deem it appropriate, where Chief Keene's probation says, yeah, we can work with this young man or this young woman. So, but I don't know how you could pass a law that would affect the DAs. What you can do perhaps is do what I'm doing now in so many areas that what I've learned this year, I mean, uh, it's the old dog learning a new trick about what we need to do to learn about racial bias and equity bias. We're doing training. I've got uh, in three weeks, I've got a UCLA professor talking to my whole staff um, for about this. So we can try and just like we did with sexual harassment. We passed laws that said we all needed to take sexual harassment and learn and emphasize it. But in terms of a statute, that'd be awfully hard because you can't dictate to a DA if you keep the statutes in existence. The only way to endure, but it won't change. The underlying statutes, the same, if there is that implicit racism, the same thing will happen with the underlying crime. 
They may not have an enhancement to go with it, but they may pay, the DA may push or a judge may select the aggravated term rather than the minimal term for reasons that are inappropriate and underneath the surface. And so uh, I hate to sound like a naysayer, Dean, but I think it's very hard for this committee to accomplish that goal um, by affecting a statute. Instead, I think it's changing the cultural mind of how we approach it. And I well, think we just started that this year. I hope so. You know, and also obviously the Racial Justice Act has passed the legislature, which will, which does aim to address this. The linchpin to that, of course, is quality data, which is my broken record. So with that, <laughs> Dean Richardson, uh, yeah. will you rephrase your question to, yes. to Chief Keene? Uh, Chief Keene. Uh, well, respectfully, Dean, uh, through the chair, I remember your question. So sure. I, I think yeah, uh, I, I figured you I figured you would. So you can rephrase <laughs> the question with your answer. Thank you, Chief Keene. <laughs> that, thank you, Dean. So uh, your question was primarily with the changes um, from felonies to misdemeanors with regard to the population I noted earlier in treatment. How do we incentivize programs at that misdemeanor level so you don't have to have felonies to get programming? So I think that it's, you know, the challenge is trying to find really what each individual person needs and kind of building off of what DA West have talked about in terms of just the individual nature of individual counties. So much of what treatment is offered and allowed really is contingent upon the county you happen to find yourself in when you're in need of that treatment. There are things that happen that we can do in San Mateo County because we have resources, because we have quality programming, because I have the trust of my DA and my judges, there are things that I can implement for misdemeanors that may not always be possible across the state. Sometimes it is simply just a resource um, issue. I listen to my peers up in Lake County and Mono County and places like that where there aren't really um, this, you know, plethora of options for them. Oftentimes there are no options. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a combination of two issues. One, it's about resource availability across the counties and how do you build resources up um, considering what's available in one county may not be available in another. So it's incentivizing programs to be present in regions across this state. And, and oftentimes that is influenced greatly by um, just the cost of living, for example. There are things that we can do in San Mateo to help some of our programs, but we know that they can't afford to go out and hang a shingle, right? To say, hey, ACME treatment program is here and we'll take all comers and we can do that. The second point I will make really quickly is to, uh, to the chair's point about what can specifically be done. I think from an incentivizing perspective, it is really about looking at what are the needs of those individual misdemeanors. And most oftentimes the carrot, so to speak, is issues around housing, it's issues around sustainability, it's issues around mobility. So you know, if you can tie incentives to those things that I think people need regardless whether they're felons or misdemeanors, I think you can make drug court models or really not even, and let me, let me not hone on that because I think oftentimes drug court models are only as good as the region in which they're implemented. And so, you know, I, I just have to be honest about that. But I do think though, that if you can incentivize the opportunity to know what this person needs and then be able to honestly give that to them, which is oftentimes, like I said, issues of mobility, issues around housing, issues around transportation, things of that nature. If you can somehow incentivize a connection between those where you can get that quality program in the short period of time that you'll be on uh, connected for misdemeanor probation, I think you can you know, better incentivize people to participate. Because right now, as a misdemeanor, I'll just simply take my short period of time and walk away and not have to do any supervision or have, have any of those types of connected things. Versus if that same case was a felony, uh, the DA would incentivize participation through allowing that person to participate, come back, have that felony reduced to a misdemeanor or potentially have it removed from their record completely. So I think that's that linchpin, unfortunately, that is missing. And I think in some of the models we have in our county really demonstrate very clearly the reduction in those uh, that population. I hope that answers the question. Yes. Thank you so much. I want much. to follow up on that before getting to our, to our final panelist here, because this is something that came up on the last group. Uh, Chief Keene, I'm struggling with this. Is this a question, is this a problem with the statutes itself or implementation of the statute? Meaning it seemed, would seem to me that a misdemeanor, which could carry a year in county jail, would be a pretty a, 
a fairly severe enough sanction to encourage people to participate in these programs. Now that's what the statute says. I know mm. the implementation of the statute does not, it was rarely mean a true year in, in jail. So, so is, that about, is that the problem of the statute or is that the problem of the implementation of the statute? I think it's a little bit of both, but I think you correctly hit on the fact that a year is not truly a year. So if that's I'm going to- That's not the year, the statute, which is what yes. we care about. The statute gives up to a year. And Correct. again, to the judges, getting back to what DA Wagstaff said, it's in their wisdom to give whatever amount of time and to the sheriffs to say, well, we're overcrowded, so we have to balance this. But the statute says a year, which to me would seem like a sufficient hammer to participate in these programs. Yeah, I mean, I understand that respectfully, Chair, but I think the reality is, is that that's just not simply how it applies in practical application. Because if I'm sitting there as an offender looking at potentially a year, which breaks down to six months or sometimes even less, depending upon the nature of what's happening in my individual county jail, I would rather have that than say I have to have a probation officer have to have constant courtroom appearances where I'm talking about my progress, the potential for me, um, finding myself caught up in other ways, having a search clause where an officer on the street can stop me and you know connect with me in that fashion. Those things are all, I think, disincentives for a person who has that option. Uh, we don't have anybody here from the public defenders to talk to that part of it, but I will say that um, I spent time as an indigent defendant attorney, and I will tell you, my clients would take a short period in time in jail over a two-year period of probation or a three-year period of probation almost 90% of the time. No, I, I, listen, I would too. I get it. Um, and it's depending on how short, but I guess one of the questions that we might have is how do you better implement, if the statute itself provides the necessary sticks, Mm -hmm. How do we encourage the implementation in a way that actually gets the things that we want done rather than just ratcheting, you know, kick it back up to a felony or 10 years? Well, hold 10 years over your head. And then, you know, then, of course, you're going to participate in these programs. That doesn't seem like a very good way to do it. Well, I won't, I won't speak for the sheriffs, but I'll quickly say, because I know we want to make sure we get uh, to the rest of the, the panel. But I'll quickly say, though, I think that you mitigate some of that by having good quality programming in your local jails. Okay. And once again, we're very fortunate in our county where our sheriff is committed to quality programming for people who are in our custody. Now, oftentimes, because the variance of how long you stay in custody will interrupt your ability to completely complete a program in an effective manner. But if you can have programming that is focused and supporting people towards rehabilitative efforts, you can undercut some of that unfortunate natural thing that happens by at least having something available for them in that system. Thank you. I'm going to switch gears slightly to introduce Nina Salerno Besselman. Again, I hope I pronounced your name absolutely correctly from Crime Victims United um, to, to help facilitate a joining of the conversation rather than starting off with a opening comments or you can choose to spend the time as you'd like. Um, we're obviously focusing on uh, improvements to the penal code, especially, you know, beginning with the next legislative cycle. And I was wondering if somebody gave you a magic wand, um, obviously we understand that your organization, you know, primarily advocates and um, on behalf of victims, to which we've heard a fair amount of today. But if somebody gave you a magic wand and looked at the penal code, what are the priorities that you would su suggest that we uh, focus on? And thank you for that. Um, and I apologize for running late. I actually was in court on a sexual assault case that ran a little longer, so I apologize for that. Thank you. Um, you know. Our perspective on that and listening to everyone, and I certainly agree with um, District Attorney Wagstaff and the Chief um, and just listening to things and waving a magic wand, I think it comes to a balance within even in the penal code system. Um, and that balance to consider what are the rehabilitative efforts. I mean, obviously, and, and Crime Victims United wholeheartedly believes in rehabilitation. Obviously, if an individual becomes rehabilitated, then we're going to have less of crime on the street and not another victim. So it becomes a balance of what are the rehabilitative measures, but also the accountability and the protection of public safety and not forgetting the victims. I obviously was very involved this year in the legislative cycle. I'm aware of the Racial um, Justice Act. I'm aware of things that um, the Senator spoke of. But what misses and all that, we also don't always talk about the victims. 
there's also a racial bias that often spills over to the victims that we often forgot in, in our criminal justice system. Um, there's also inherently a sexual bias that also spills over. Um, women still to this day, many of my rape victims are judged because of where they were when the rape went or if they were working as a prostitute. And many people don't think they have the right to say no because of their chosen profession when they were doing that to survive. So I think for me and my perspective, if I had that magic wand and could redo the entire penal code in California, it would be the balance in of- two minutes or less, of course. Accountability um, with some penalties, because I do think we have to have that as a hammer if we are going to incentivize people. I think the chief is exactly right. We see it all the time, that there is really nothing right now to um, pull people into wanting to rehabilitate in many of the programs. I do think a public-private partnership and bringing quality programs into the local county jails would be very important. Um, but I also think that um, we have trampled on the rights of crime victims that are inherent in our constitution. And that needs to come back and be balanced within our penal code system. So for, can you give us an example again, and I'm putting you on the spot and you know, we can always come back to you, but, but, but very specific reforms to the penal code in ways that we might be able to improve these is what we're looking for. I'll give you a great example. We just passed um, AB, I think it's 2124 that the governor signed on the 30th of this month by um, Assemblymember Ting, which makes all misdemeanors eligible for diversion, including DUIs. Nowhere in there did it provide for the victim to be hurt. And that is a very specific balance. I think a victim, a sexual assault victim of a misdemeanor, um, right now, rape of an unconscious person is a misdemeanor in California. Domestic violence is a misdemeanor in California. Nowhere did that provide, and nowhere is that going into our penal code system or our statutes where it says that the victim's voice needs to be considered before we even divert this person. So, so let me understand that. I, that, it was, that was something that I was unaware of. In mis so obviously I'm aware of Marcy's law and there's a lot of victims' rights in, in the bigger cases that you know, we, we hear about a lot. But you're saying in misdemeanor cases, the victims have no rights to participate in that, in that process? The statute that was just passed does not provide for them to be heard before the court diverts a person on certain... Uh, uh, there's a very narrow category of misdemeanors that were excluded, but the majority of misdemeanor crimes which have victims, there is no vehicle for them to be heard before this person is diverted into some type of program. Got it. And are they explicit, explicitly excluded by the statute or just as no mechanism to include them? Well, in my my opinion, I think they were explicitly excluded. Um, the language of the no statute, mechanism. I'm not just, I'm just, in the statute itself. In a statute, there is no mechanism. No mechanism. And that was so something not, that we brought not, from the But it's yeah. not something that's, that's, that's explicitly excluded in the statute. No. I just wanted to no, understand. No, but there's no mechanism. Okay. So, and that would be, so the proposal, just to get, to make sure I understand, is that to have victims of Mr. Beaner be able to participate in the same way that they participate in felonies. Yes, to be heard and to, so that their safety, the safety of the community is considered before we put somebody that's committed. Many of our misdemeanors are, can be very serious offenses. I take rape of an unconscious person as a very serious offense. I take human trafficking a child as a very serious offense. They're not serious and violent in our penal code right now. And so therefore we have a host of crimes that are pretty violent, very serious and harmful to society where the victims have no say. Sure, and and I don't, and some are there's you know distinctions between misdemeanors and serious and violent crimes. There's a whole like spectrum there, but I, I get I get what you're saying about victims having a say in misdemeanor crimes. Uh, it's a little bit of a it's I'm going to use this as a segue to talk about um, something that we've talked about at a at a prior uh, committee hearing that I particularly were interested in what the prosecutors' perspectives on. Um, um, and this is the issue of Estes robberies. I don't know if you guys have thought much about it, but um, DA Wagstaff, this particularly um, struck me when you, were, you started off saying, let's judges be judges. And we've taken that away from them. We've given a lot of power to the prosecutors. And Estes robberies to me seem like a particular area in that regard, in that it's a uh, shoplifting is a, is a misdemeanor 
with some exceptions, right? But for the most part, it's a misdemeanor. Um, but um, an Estes robbery, if there's any threat or uh, confrontation with the um, uh, security at the store, then it becomes a robbery. And that, whether or not to charge that as a misdemeanor shoplifting or a um, felon, felony, but not just a felony, a violent felony, a strike felony, there's a, there's a wide range there. And there's no like middle ground of like aggravated shop. Some states have kind of an aggravated shoplifting kind of statute. I was wondering if you thought that this was a big jump, if this is, can judges, should judges have more of a say to say like, you know what, this is this really should have been charged as a misdemeanor or punished as a misdemeanor or some in-between ground. I was wondering if you thought that this was a, and it seems, again, it's not murder, it's not gang allegations, but it does seem just the, the volume, it's a pr probably a big volume of cases that fall into this category of an area that we might invite more judicial discretion. I was wondering if your reaction to that. Uh, support it, I think you're right. I think uh, you're going to get 58 different uh, approaches, perhaps in 58 DAs. But I like. But if the, uh, a step to be taken would be to say what you just said. You know, give discretion to the judges to be able to basically. I don't necessarily like that because that's changing the charging function. And I don't think charging function under our system belongs with the DAs. But I also don't have a problem in saying, you know what, uh, on a first time like that, it can only be charged as the petty theft plus a battery and something of that nature. Uh, or all together. I do not, Estes is something we try to do with some caution because of the reasons you just mentioned, the consequences and the jump so big. And so if the committee were to simply say, you know what, Estes, which as you know, was created by our courts, that was not uh, a legislative step, um, wasn't going to exist anymore. I wouldn't sit there and say, oh my heavens, you've taken away one of our great tools in protecting public safety. I think that's an easy step, Michael. DA Nunez. Yeah, you know, um, if a, a person has some property, like, for example, a purse sitting next to him on a park bench, and somebody runs across and, and steals that, that's, you know, grand theft person. If, the, you know, the victim grabs their property, and a struggle ensues, and, you know, they're beaten down and everything else, that quickly turns into a robbery. You, Estes kind of follows that thinking. Um, I am not opposed to the idea of, of putting discretion on the back end of, of, of those types of sentences, where if a judge believes at some point in time that the individual can earn a, a reduction to a 487, that might be something that you want to employ. Um, you, you know, the opportunity for judges to review these individuals and make sure that they are um, doing everything that they can on probation and then earn a reduction. I, I think that that is a vehicle that this committee can can um, explore a lot more, which is the opportunity to have maybe serious crimes reduced to general felonies um, and and through the avenues of probation and parole, making sure that these people have made the necessary steps to um, ameliorate some of the, you know, the harshness of, of, of some of these uh, um, you know, long lasting effects. But the fact remains- before you, on, but before you go on that, I just wanna make sure I understand what you're saying is, um, which is interesting. So you're saying you're charged with a serious or violent offense. Not violent, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with violent. Okay, probably. okay let's go, serious offense. I mean, well, Estes robberies are violent, right? That's the, that's, that's the problem. So, yeah. but let's, okay, let's just say serious offenses, residential burglary. Um, that's true. And, and let's say that that's, that, that the judge could say, you still get residential burglary, but I'm gonna strike the serious part of the residential burglary so that it doesn't come back to haunt you as a strike later on. You know, that's, this is something that's gonna to have to be explored with all of the, the DAs and, and, and a lot of the, the parties that have you know, an, an interest in this, but maybe it's something that is earned after five years or 10 years or some, some that, number that, of that years. That's something you're suggesting. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I understood the, the idea. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, and then I cut you off. Go ahead. Yeah, there's there's so many stakeholders involved, but you know, rather than than take that discretion from the DA, from the judge that's re, that's hearing the case, from the the sentencing judge, from the appellate courts that are that are reviewing all of these uh, fact based you know factual decisions, you know, if a robbery is there based on you know somebody coming into a store and and committing, you know, you know th that taking through force or fear after that entire review process, if that robbery still stands, 
I think that's the appropriate thing that, that, that should occur in that case. Now, if an individual is going through uh, mental illness, if they're going through drug issues, if, they're, if they've had a long standing problem, they get clean after five years, 10 years, then let's talk to the stakeholders and see if that there is something that we can do to show that this individual has gotten on the right, right track after that conviction. And maybe that's something that you want to reduce in some sort of meaningful way. I think that's so fair. So it's interesting that you brought up the idea of this sort of washout period for prior serious crimes, let's say. Is that what you were suggesting? It, it, it's, it's quite possible. You know, there's, there's a, a number of individuals in state prison right now on, on second, second strike cases. Um, second strike doesn't mean as much as it, it, it used to under Prop 57, um, you know, but that's a, a kind of a separate issue. The, the point is, is that, you know, the, the force of a, of a serious or a violent crime on individuals and their and their futures is not that significant right now on second strike cases. Um, if, you know, if, if a period of time passes, then maybe so, you know, there's the Romero case that washes out a lot of these strikes where the where courts, the courts don't even impose the strike anymore after a period of time. So right. one of the things, one of the things that we're considering, I'm sorry to cut you off, we're, we're a little bit short on time is to um, put a little bit more uh, discretion as um, DA Wagstaff was saying, or direction to judges in Romero and other circumstances to say, hey, if this was a serious prior from X years ago, maybe there should be a presumption, again, still giving authority to judges to override that presumption that we won't consider this a strike if it was 10 years ago or some other mitigated circumstance. Um, but just might... to be on record, I'm, I'm opposed to uh, saying that Estes robbery should be written out of the penal code. I hear you. And we're not trying to write them out of the penal code. It's just the middle ground. It seems to be what I was trying to say is, is this huge jump from a misdemeanor to a violent felony as a strike. And there doesn't seem to be this sort of aggravated choplifting middle ground. A lot of them get solved for 487, which is grand theft person. Um, the judges will know that a lot of times that is the middle ground that prosecutors and defense attorneys reach, uh, especially on first offenses. Got it. All right, we have about five le minutes left or less on this panel. I don't know if any of the other members have questions. Assembly member, Common Law Doug, Dove. Thank you. I have a few quick ones. I was just wondering um, what your positions were on or are on the 1275 hold um, and its application. I think this is probably for the DAs. I'm. I'm not sure, maybe Paul, you know, I'm not fully sure what you mean by the 1275 holds. Uh, with bail? Bail, yeah. Oh, just the bail? Generally well, on bail? So it's, yeah, like, you know, if you decide to accept the money, right? Isn't that what that one's about? If you yeah, believe, if I mean, you if I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm being dense here, but I'm uh, a disbeliever in money bail, so. Um, well, I guess my question was more so about, you know, its application and probably its inconsistent application based on yeah. race, location, history of the defendant, you know, bias, class. I, every one of those, I agree. I think that's how our world has evolved. And I would add in there that um, it totally discriminates against on a, most of all on an economic level, more so than anything economic level. Uh, for those counties around the state where you don't have great diverse populations, it's still a problem because you've got uh, poor people who can't afford $5,000 bail and you have other people. In my county, we had a woman post 64 million. So uh, that's why I agree. I don't think, I think inherently it is an unfair system and I do not support it. But it's, I mean, the 1275 is still used now. Um, hopefully not in, two, in about uh, two months. Right. WDDA. Well, you, you know, we there's some pilot programs that are that are that are ongoing right now that are talking about risk risk assessment, and that's generally what I'm thinking about when I'm reviewing a case for filing, um, and the charges that I'm that I'm putting on uh, you know putting on this complaint um, are sometimes very serious and and will require significant large sums of of bail if they're going to be released. Um, that I think is a product of the idea that, that these are violent crimes and you, you're basically making sure that a violent, somebody accused of a violent crime isn't going to necessarily get out. If we switch that to a risk assessment tool, 
where if an individual is charged with a very serious crime, they had a gun, there's multiple victims involved, they have a, a, a criminal history that reflects uh, violence, then, then maybe we can move to that. And I think that there is, there is a process in place and there's pilot programs that are, that are being um, implemented right now that are seeing how effective those are in keeping the public safe. Um, you know, the, the worst thing that we all fear is that an individual that was in custody is released and then commits a, an, another crime. Um, I know that in Houston, there was a, a, a sergeant that was, that was recently killed after there was a review process uh, for domestic violence on a case that had happened two or three days before. Um, you know, I'm not sure what happened in that review process. All I am saying is that that, that is the risk assessment pro process that we have to look at to make sure that people that, that would potentially commit a crime days after their release don't happen. Well, okay, so to be clear, I certainly didn't want this to end up into a discussion about, you know, Prop 25, but it's more about the fact that there's one thing to talk about people sort of, you know, pleading out or having to stay in because they can't afford it. It's another thing to say if there's a suspicion that, um, the bail money that's being used, uh, that's being posted was um, sort of gained from criminal activity. And so you're not gonna accept it. So I'm talking about that because that's a process and that's an application that's still happening now. So I just wanted to know your positions on that. Um, but I see it switched into something larger. My second question was, is there any data on the types of crimes that are committed by defendants that rehabilitate more successfully? Mm. Assemblywoman, I don't think that there is specific data on that. Um, I think that what you will see, though, is that there is a lot of information that suggests when those rehabilitative efforts kind of take hold. So, for example, we do know now that, and I'm sure you are aware of this probably more than most, that um, when rehabilitation is going to take hold, it generally does so within that first year and a half or so to two years. So it doesn't really happen over extended periods of time. So as, uh, as the chair has mentioned, oftentimes data is really the thorn in a true evaluation of what really works um, in our state in this area. Uh, we do uh, track rehabilitation in our county. Uh, we have found that uh, we have some good sense of it generally what happens and what types of uh, mixtures of services and supports help uh, to become most effective. But I can't tell you today what types of crimes would fit into that category to say uh, persons who commit these types of crimes rehabilitate with more success than others. Mm -hmm. I do know that what we found, uh, generally speaking, is that when there is a holistic kind of uh, global approach to rehabilitation, where you're really trying to get down to the roots of what brought a person to the system in the first place and provide supports in that area, I know that universally we found that those types of programs mm -hmm. and supports that are evidence-based uh, that are holistic in nature and then supported um, by the system in your particular region will have the most uh, positive in, uh, impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then my, oh, I'm sorry, did someone want to add? Oh, and then my final question, I know we had a, we did chat a lot about the gang enhancements, but I was wondering, especially for the DAs, have you seen many cases where the gang enhancement has been found to not be true? Uh, DA, did you want to answer first or do you want me no, to No, go, go ahead, ahead, Paul. You've got the greater experience. We just don't get that much in San Mateo County. Right. Of course. Um, the gang allegation uh, um, on occasion is, is not um, not found true by a jury. It is not held to answer uh, by judges on occasion. Um, we are very cautious when we're filing gang, gang allegations to make sure that um, it was either to promote or in association with, you know, a, a group of gang members before we file this. You know, the gang allegation for 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 a lot of cases uh, does not impose any greater sentence on an individual, um, but it is it is oftentimes used to uh, to to produce the the motive or to show the motive to the to the jury. Um, many judges would not allow gang evidence. Uh, to be presented if the gang allegation wasn't there because of what they consider to be prejudicial effects on the jury. But just as if, um, you know, a domestic violence situation, you know, the, the, there might be motive in, in, in that relationship, 
you know, the gang allegation of Roland 60s, you know, committing a crime in, in, in Roland 40s territory, um, that, you know, why did those individuals go into that neighborhood? A lot of times it's, it's that gang allegation that brings that motive to this jury. So but they're, still, that, they're still open to increased punishment. I mean, and are, what are the checks and balances yes. for that, right? I mean, so the, the checks and balances are Judge Espinoza right here. I mean, he's making sure that that I have satisfied the gang allegation as it's written in the penal code. The other thing that's happening is Justice Moreno would not, uh, on the appellate process, would make sure that the gang allegation uh, was rightfully imposed. And, right. you know, um, the thing about the gang allegation that has happened since it was was written into law was that we have, you know, an abundance of, of decisions that inform what we do on the gang allegation on a daily basis. And so that review process has informed, restricted, expanded the gang allegation to, to, to in the areas that are most relevant in a court of law and to the, to the set of facts that are imposed. I don't mean to say, you know, if the gang allegation wasn't there, the crime is still gonna happen. The, 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 the minorities that are being killed in gang situations are still going to be killed. Um, you know, um, and then on the low end of the, of the case, the gangs really do impose their will upon communities on a daily basis. Um, if you look at on Google Maps right now, Wabash and Evergreen, Wabash and Evergreen is in the heart of East LA. The judges have probably been to that neighborhood because there's a famous restaurant, El Tepeyac, um, on, on Wabash. And if you go there for a Manny special, you, you, will, you, will, you will enjoy that bur burrito and probably get the heck out um, because there's really no other businesses around there. But right uh, down the street, and the reason I know about this community is because it's one of our clear neighborhoods, but Ascension uh, Elementary School is right there. You see KAM uh, spray painted throughout that neighborhood because crazy ass Mex Mexicans um, dominate that neighborhood. And you can never get away from that level of graffiti just imposing its will upon that community on a daily basis. Okay, I don't, I don't I want to- I, 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 I understand, yeah, I understand that, but I do question your the statement around being rightfully imposed because I think the other question is when it isn't imposed. I mean, I would argue that, you know, Aryan Brotherhood is as much a gang as rolling 60s. And yet when they come up with drug charges because they are rampant in a particular community, a gang enhancement is not levied. And so I think it goes back to the question that the chair answered in the very, asked in the very beginning about the disparities. So well, I just, I just, you know, cause we, we to always tend to talk about one group of gangs and then there seems to be some judgment on- In LA others. County, so. In LA County, we do impose the, the gang uh, allegation on prison gangs. We do impose just, it on motorcycle gangs. Um, you know, I've filed the gang allegation uh, on the, the Tunerville gang that's up in the uh, La Crescenta area and uh, Silmar and Pacoima. There have been um, Caucasian members of that gang that I've, that I've filed on as well. So I'm going to wrap this up unless anybody else has additional questions because we're all over time. Uh, Judge Espinoza, I, go ahead. You've been quiet. You know, I, I don't have any questions. I have two observations. I still take the position that it's unconscionable use, to use the gang enhancement to elevate a misdemeanor to a felony. And it's also it's equally uh, unconscionable. And we've, we've raised this issue before. Um, when you have someone who has is able to establish that they are suffering from a serious mental illness or having some sort of psychotic episode at the time that they commit their Estes robbery, I think there should be some sort of prohibition on filing an Estes robbery under those circumstances. Having said that, I just want to say hi to Paul. It's been about 25 years since you appeared before me and just say that Wabash and Evergreen is in the heart of the Espinosa ancestral homeland. Um, so I know that neighborhood quite well. That's it. I, I should also say that I'm a veteran of uh, appearing before Justice Judge Espinoza as well. So I've had the honor of appearing before the honor. Uh, <laughs> all right. So here's Chair, so, Chair so, Mano, may, yeah. may I just really quickly? Um, there was a question that got asked really early on that I don't want to miss. Uh, there was a question about uh, what counties the pilot programs for Tay 
we're operating in. Yeah. Um, and I think Judge Espinosa had asked that question. Uh, those counties are Alameda, Butte, Napa, Nevada, and in Santa Clara. And then back in 2018, uh, Ventura County was added. Right. And, and your impression is that these are generally well received? I think they are. I mean, I think there are challenges certainly still uh, to getting uh, more young people, more young adults into that program. Um, but it's really, you know, strictly voluntary. So it goes back to, I think, the Dean's question about how do you incentivize people to take part in programs. So that same issue even exists in a program such as this, which is really geared towards keeping that population out of county jails, keeping them in a more rehabilitative environment, but still trying to get people to participate has been a challenge. So it really gets back to how do we create incentives uh, towards programming that doesn't have to have uh, such a big stick like a felony associated with it. Terrific. Dean Richardson, did you have a follow up there? Dean Richardson, did you have a follow up? No, you're good. All right. So. As I end all of these sessions, we will be in touch. In particular, you know, the broken record is the data. We would love to see the gang data, but all the data from LA County and charging decisions and how that plays out. As we said, as I said, it's the tail that wags a dog. I'd really love to um, you to work, help us work with your various associations. You've been sent by your associations to help us uncover some of this data. So much of this back and forth between all sides goes in these anecdotal stories that I'm not sure, we don't know what's the reality here. Um, and I think far too much of our criminal justice laws, criminal laws are determined by these anecdotes. I think that we can all agree upon that. And the data does exist. It's difficult to obtain. We're doing our best to try to find it. Interpreting it is also going to be difficult, and we'd love your help on that too. I'm not just saying, you know, give us your data and go away. Um, so, you know, that's just something that we're really, it's part of the long term project of this um, committee. I hope that you guys can help us with that. Um, and again, I, I promise to be in touch. We want to be very transparent, as Dean Wagstaff, I mean, excuse me, DA Wagstaff suggested. Um, about our proposals, no surprises should be there. Um, and that um, we, you know, we're gonna ask you and your associations for their input um, as we uh, proceed here. So thank you, thank you all yet again. Um, unless there's any members of the committee, I'm gonna take another five minute break. Okay, that objection, we're gonna take another five minute break to uh, 12, 28, I mean, excuse me, 12, 18, and then we'll have public comment period. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate your time, especially under these circumstances. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Appreciate it. Good luck. <laughs>